Heavenly Father, as we take up the studies this morning, we ask that you'd grant us the presence of your Holy Spirit, pour your latter rain out upon us, bless the production and the transmission of this message, uh, that wherever it goes, it might glorify and honor you, and that it might be used to edify your people. Uh, please be in attendance now as we take up the study in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to just do some loose ends this morning. This is, if you ever become familiar with spiritual Babylon in terms of how Christianity through the years has commented on it, and by that I meant, mean written books, whether it's Protestant Christianity or Adventist, this here, this book, is the Bible for that study. You're not going to find any Protestant Christian or any Adventist Christian that writes about spiritual Babylon, about the papacy, that doesn't use this as its primary source of reference. Okay, now not everything that, that Hislop says in here is accurate, but um, maybe it says in here when he wrote it. Um, and uh, see, all this has been reprinted so many times it doesn't give it give the original date that he wrote it, but a couple hundred years old, I'm sure. Really? I thought it was like early 19th century, the 1900s. Oh, really? Okay, that could be. It's it's got um, a printing in 1943. Um, I don't know. He he he's doesn't that point don't matter anyway this is the point of reference for the published 1853 okay there you go um thanks for google so w one of the things that so, go ahead go, yeah you say it. it was published in 1853 um but i've referred to one of the illustrations he has in this book i don't know if larry can zoom in on this can you yeah. You got it? Okay. Um, it says, but when we look at what is said of Samarimus, the wife of Ninus, the evidence receives additional development. The evidence goes conclusively to show that the wife of Ninus could be none other than the wife of Nimrod, and further to bring out one of the grand characters in which Nimrod, when deified, was adored. Um, so this is, this is one of the idols that illustrates... Nimrod's wife, and as history goes onward and different cultures take up that worship, they will take this idol and other of the pagan idols and make them their own and change their names. Uh, and what I'm saying here, these, if you can see it here, these are breasts. She's got, I don't know, 3, 7, 10, 11, 12, 13 at least 13 breasts, maybe 14, 15, who knows. Um, she's the mighty breasted one because she's supposed to be the mother of all. Okay, And this is where at the Council of Ephesus in the early history of the Catholic Church, they took her only when they incorporated her into Catholicism, they incorporated it from one of her more recent manifestations. It wasn't Nimrod's wife, they were calling her Diana in Ephesus, and at the Council of Ephesus, they took Diana as one of their pagan symbols and called her the Virgin Mary, you know, the mother, the wonderful mother. But, but my point was, is her hat here. If you can see her hat, it looks a little bit like a tower, but it's a, um, it's a fortress. It's got, if you can look at it afterwards closely, so when you get to Daniel and it talks about a god of fortresses, um, it's Hislop goes on. He says, in Daniel 11.38, we read of a god called Al-Mohazin, the god of fortifications. Okay, and that's what we're talking about is that you're going to worship a god that his fathers knew not. And it's a, a god of fortresses in the Hebrew or Hislop is saying a god of fortifications. And this crown of hers is, a, is symbolizing that attribute of her, of her what she um, represents symbolically in paganism. And 
if you don't know it, if you, if you read this book, um, the, the story goes is that Nimrod was a black guy, a big, strong black warrior, but Samarimus was a, a blonde-haired white woman. And they were in the middle of a battle one time, supposedly, and she just walked out in the battlefield, and she was so beautiful that the, the battle stopped from her beauty, okay? So she's associated with warfare. She's the one that brings warfare to an end. And supposedly, they say she's the one that came up with the idea of making walled cities. In that history, there hadn't been walled cities. Supposedly, she's the one that invented it, and that's why she has this crown. So just putting that on the record, we've referred to it. Um, that's Nimrod's wife, and what we're saying is this current pope is going to worship a god that his fathers knew not, and what he's doing, he's reaching out to um, the goddess of Mother Earth here as part of his uh, program to bring the world into Sunday sacredness. Um, okay, so if you have your notes, and I don't know why... It didn't retain the attributes of the page numbers, but it don't matter, they're stapled. On page one of your notes, um, we have a... Yeah, these are today's notes. I will go ahead when, when you get settled. One of the things we've dealt with is the holding of the four winds. We've understood that, um, go to Revelation 7. This is old standard understanding um, in this movement. Verse 1 through 3 of Revelation 7 says, And after these things I saw four angels standing on four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees till we've sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. So there is a restraint placed upon the four winds while the sealing process is taking place. And um, if you go to Revelation 9, um, in verse 3, uh, you'll see the locusts, locusts coming upon the earth. That's Im Islam in Revelation 9. And in verse 4 it says, And it was commanded them, it was commanded Islam, that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And there's no way that you can escape, escape that the terminology here is the same as Revelation um, 7, 2 and 3. Islam is given a command to hurt uh, not those men and women that have the seal of God, but they can hurt those that don't have the seal of God. And we use a passage in the Spirit of Prophecy where Sister White says, angels are holding the four winds represented as an angry horse seeking to break loose and bring death and destruction in its path. That's a paraphrase. So we've understood that Islam um, is the four winds that are restrained during the sealing time period. On top of that, we've understood that Balaam, as a false prophet, represents the United States, and he's riding an ass in the story of Balaam and the ass. A ass is a symbol of Islam, and in that story, we understand that there are three times that Balaam strikes the ass because of disobedience, and we mark the first strike at 9-11, and then there are two more strikes in the story of Balaam and the ass. And the third time that he strikes him, both the ass and Balaam fall down. So we mark the falling down uh, at the third strike as the fall of the sixth kingdom of Bible prophecy. Um, 
and we mark the beginning of the sealing process, therefore, at 9-11. And from 9-11 until the Sunday Law is the sealing of Adventism, so to speak. But there are people that come in at the Sunday Law, the Nethanims, the 11th hour workers, the one hour laborers, however you want to label them. They also go into the sealing process. So because of that, this particular quote from Early Writings, page 38, and we like the the page number 38, but it's, it's in early writings. Early writings is a gathering together of books, and this isn't really what you'd call the original. Uh, being experience and views would be the original, and it's like page 102 or 103 in there. But early writings 38 is nice because it's 38 is a number associated with Islam, so we're using it. So I want to read this. I saw four angels who had a work to do on the earth and were on their way to accomplish it. Jesus was clothed with priestly garments. He gazed in pity, pity on the remnant, then raised his hands and with a voice of deep pity cried. And please notice this. My blood, because he's going to say my blood how many times? Four times. And he's going to say hold, hold, hold how many times? Four times. But when it's with my blood, there's a distinction between the first expression and the last three. It says, my blood, Father, my blood, my blood, my blood. Whereas when it says hold, it's just hold, 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 hold. Okay. Then I saw an exceeding bright light come from God who set up on the great white throne and was shed all about Jesus. Then I saw an angel with a commission from Jesus, swiftly flying to the four angels who had a work to do on the earth, and waving something up and down in his hand, and crying with a loud voice, Hold, 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 until the servants of God are sealed in their foreheads. I asked my accompanying angel the meaning of what I heard, and what the four angels were about to do. He said to me that it was God that restrained the powers, and that he gave his angels charge over things on the earth, that the four angels had power from God to hold the four winds, and that they were about to let them go. But while their hands were loosening and the four winds were about to blow, the merciful eye of Jesus gazed on the remnant that were not sealed. And he raised his hand to the Father and pleaded with him that he had spilled his blood for them. Then another angel was commissioned to fly swiftly to the four angels and bid them hold until the servants of God were sealed with the seal of the living God in their foreheads. So on this line up here, um, I want to make an argument about this. And it's, it's based upon things that we already understand or already have put in place. That... Here, Islam is restrained, and I'm saying that the whole is the restraint of the four winds, and here we see it four times, okay? But Islam is also illustrated in the story of Balaam, so this would be the first restraint. We're arguing that this would be the second restraint, and this would be the third restraint, because this is where... Many reasons to put the third restraint of Islam here. Uh, one of those is that in Revelation 13, 11, at the Sunday law, this is Daniel 11, verse 41, the United States speaks, okay? And as a second witness to that, John the Baptist's father speaks here at this way mark. Um, he's been made dumb when he disbelieved the prophecy back here, Zechariah, and he's made dumb. Um, and when they're finally arguing about amongst themselves, his family, what they're going to name John the Baptist, then he can speak. So you have the United States speaking here. You have Zechariah speaking here. And what does the name Zechariah mean? It means God remembers. Okay, so from 1798... To here, you have the history of Tyre in Isaiah 23. And Tyre is forgotten. 
for the days of one king, the days of the sixth kingdom of Bible prophecy, the United States. So here, Zechariah means remembered. Okay, now she's going to be remembered. And what becomes the issue here? The Sabbath. And what, are, what is the, the bottom line of the Sabbath? Remember the Sabbath day. So remembering is marked here both by Isaiah 23, by the Sabbath, by Zechariah. But here's where Zechariah ceases to be dumb and he speaks. And the United States speaks as a dragon. And this is where the ass, after being struck the third time, what's it do? What's he do? He speaks to Balaam. So we got lots of reasons to put the third strike of Islam here at the Sunday law. And both the ass and the United States fall down. And this is the fall of the sixth kingdom of Bible prophecy. And we have other witnesses to the fall here of the United States. So what that says, in, and I want to back this up now and let you think through this. When he says, my blood, Father, my blood, my blood, my blood, perhaps there's a distinction between the first restraint of the four winds. Okay, so I'm just going to put, I don't know, a check mark here. At 9-11 there was an attack. But here I'm going to say it's a nuclear attack. And here it's a nuclear attack. And I'm going to say that after the United States falls, Islam is going to do another nuclear attack. And what I'm saying is, my blood, Father, my blood, my blood, my blood. Hold, 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 hold. With the expression, my blood, you, got, you have four my bloods and four holds, but with my blood you've got a distinction between the first and 9-11 was not a nuclear attack. Okay. A second witness to this, being a nuclear attack, is what? And it's something that we've spent time on. Okay, now let me do it this way. Over here, I'm saying, I've made the, tried to make the case that in Revelation 17 and 18, the ten kings are going to burn the papacy with fire. And when they burn her with fire, they're not going to be anywhere close to her. They're going to stand afar off and watch the smoke of their torment, and I'm saying that's nuclear. But I'm saying that here, it isn't Islam. It's the Ten Kings. Okay, Ten Kings. So what's my second witness to this? The doubling. The doubling. This history here, the image of the beast in the United States, it begins with a nuclear attack from Islam and the image of the beast in the world begins with a nuclear attack from Islam. It ends with a nuclear attack from the Ten Kings. This ends with the end of the Ten Kings and a nuclear attack. <laughs> Crazy that we're up here talking so casually about nuclear attacks, but it, 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 I'm not really trying to emphasize the nuclear part, I'm trying to show that the prophetic structure kind of is laying this out that way. Not kind of. Um, take the if out of it, huh? Okay, so now if you would, I'm going to switch gears now. I'm just, remember, I'm just tying some loose ends together. Go to Ezekiel um, 28, is it? Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 29. Ezekiel 29. In verse 2 and 3. Ezekiel 29, verse 2 and 3 says, Son of man, set thy face against Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and prophesy against him and against all Egypt. Speak and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the great dragon that lieth in the midst of the rivers, which is said, Mine river is mine own, and I've made it for myself. 
the dragon is Egypt. Okay, so the dragon is Satan. And yesterday we read from Great Controversy in yesterday's notes where Sister White is commenting. She says, the dragon in Revelation 12 is Satan, but in a secondary sense, it is pagan Rome. Okay, so the dragon has many manifestations, um, but it's always, it always can be categorized as Satan. So I want to show you something here about the dragon, if I can. Go to page two of your notes on the bottom where it says December 25th. <clears throat> okay, these are some of the dates in history where December 25th has occurred. And you'll see in the year 274, it says Sol Invictus, and that means unconquered sun. Sol Invictus was the official sun god of the later Roman Empire and a patron of soldiers. On the 25th of December, A.D. 274, the Roman Emperor Aurelian made it an official cult alongside the traditional Roman cults. Okay, if you, I just cut this out of Wikipedia and I, the rest of what they were going to say was, I didn't want to throw it all in, but it, it identifies that Rome here in 274 has reached back into the history of Egypt to worship their sun god. So on, when it comes to the Roman Empire, pagan Rome, there are several things to remember. One is, prophetically, pagan Rome is the dragon. Sister White says the dragon in Revelation 12 is Satan, but in a secondary sense it's pagan Rome. So this is about the dragon. But it's pagan Rome that placed the papacy on the throne of the earth. Thus typifying who? The United States. So this, is, this has got a connection with the United States. And on December 25th, in 274, the worship of the sun was incorporated into pagan Rome's history. So December 25th has a connection with the day of the sun. And it's the dragon's day of the sun, back to Egypt. Okay, so what I'm saying up here is that the story of the dragon, and I move this around for those of you that are tuning in today. I put it in the right order. In Revelation, the dragon, the beast, and false prophet are always expressed that way. And I'm saying these four kingdoms are the subject of Daniel's last vision. The kingdom of the dragon, the kingdom of the beast, the kingdom of the false prophet, and the kingdom of the 144,000. And I'm saying that the, the story where the kingdom of the dragon is laid out is the story of the king of the south. That's a dragon power. And it plays out in human history, because it's a world history, between Trump and Putin. And the story of the beast is the story of Fatima that plays out in human history through the story of the white pope and the black pope. And the story of the false prophet is the story of the Constitution, and it plays out in human history between the Republicans and the Democrats. And this, the story of the 144,000 is the story of them perfectly reflecting the character of Christ, and Christ was three things. He was a prophet, a priest, and king, and the prophet is the false prophet, the priest is the papacy, or lines up with it, and the king is these kings, these ten kings. Okay, so this storyline of the 144,000 has a philosophical, if that's the right way, connection with these, this threefold union. Um, and when it comes to this story, I want us to see that the dragon, that one of its characteristics is December 25th. In the year 274, they begin to worship the sun, or they make that pagan Rome. Takes the sun worship from Egypt, where it originated in Egypt, which is the dragon power, and makes it part of 
the empire of pagan Rome. And the empire of pagan Rome is typifying the empire of the United States. Therefore, at some point in time, the United States is going to make the worship of the sun um, the same way that pagan Rome implemented the worship of the sun. Okay, pardon me? The Sunday law. Okay, but what's the date that's associated with it? December 25th. Okay, so in the year 496, Clovis, king of France, converts to Catholicism. And you, don't, you can't believe these Catholic stories, um, but nevertheless, this is, the, this is the story that they have associated with Clovis. Um, he's in a battle. He's in a war that he's about to lose. It's obvious he's going to lose. And he's, he's not a Catholic. He's a pagan. Uh, but his wife's Catholic, and her name's Clotilda. And in the midst of this war, supposedly he cries out, O oh God of Clotilda, if you will give me this battle, I will become a Catholic. And immediately the battle turned in his favor, and he won the battle, and he goes into, history tells us what, what temple it was, but he goes in there and he gets baptized on December 25th, 496. And we have for years and years taught that Clovis typifies who? He, well, we weren't t t saying Trump. He typifies the United States, but now we got more focus. He typifies Trump, okay? So what's that teaching us about the United States here at the end? Is that they're going to be in some kind of military struggle, and there's going to be, he's going to decide that if he can win this battle, that he is going to become a Catholic, Trump's wife is Catholic, and yesterday I saw another little news deal where on Ash Wednesday, he, he, he actually celebrated Ash Wednesday with his wife there just a few days ago. Okay, Trump's wife is Catholic. Uh, what's her name? Uh, Melania. Melania. Okay, not Clotilda, but Melania. And he's, he's getting... Okay, so... I'm saying we have the right prophetically because this was on December 25th that he gets baptized. Uh, Clovis does. Here, pardon me. He says that he was baptized Christmas Day 508. That's wrong. Is it? That's, that's... Uh, Clovis was baptized. Yeah, that's someone that is trying to argue that his baptism was the removing of the daily. But if you look in history, it's going to be 496, I think. Yeah, okay, I, I, there, you know, that's a big story about 508, some misunderstandings about what the removing of the daily was, it sounds like to me, and Wikipedia is kind of iffy. I'm going to stick with 496. I, I, know what, I know what the argument about 508 is, and I think some zealous Adventists made a mistake there. So, in this history, 274, they're going to worship the sun. In 496, they're going to convert to Catholicism. Right? Is that a, a, a correct representation of that history? Yes. Okay. That's on December 25th. So, what happened in the year 800? The Pope crowned Charlemagne Emperor of Rome. Okay, now who's Charlemagne? He, what did they call him? Uh... There's a, there's a title for him. But who is Charlemagne? Okay. It, one, thing, one thing, I think he's, he's, he was the main guy that was uh, going with his armies against Islam, right? Was he? That, that may very well be. Um, the, Charlemagne, I know the least about, that's why I'm asking his history. But he becomes the, the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. Okay. And, but who, who makes him the emperor? The Pope. Justinian, this is the year 800. Okay. Justinian's long gone by then. So Charlemagne, let's keep it simple. He's, a, he's royalty of Europe. 
Okay, he's a king of Europe. And the Pope makes him the emperor. If the Pope makes you emperor, who's actually in charge? The Pope. the Pope. Okay, so what do you have, though, with that arrangement in the year 800? Union, Union of Church and State. So who would Charlemagne be? He'd be the head of the ten kings, the kings of Europe. He'd be Trump, but he'd be the head of the United Nations. And the Pope is, they've agreed to give their kingdom unto the beast for one hour on December 25th, the year 800. So this is, what is it, Revelation 17, that says they agree to give their kingdom. I'm going to use that as my marker. For one hour, is that 15? 17. 17, 17. Oh, that's Revelation 17, 17. This is the combination of the kings with the papacy. So what I'm saying is the papacy's, the mark of the papacy is Sunday worship. And... Clovis is converting to the papacy here, and the papacy is giving the kings of Europe, or Charlemagne, their authority here. So you see the papacy in all this history, but this is a story about the dragon. This December 25th is a date about the dragon power. So when was it, and I'm saying that it's part of the king of the south, when was it, that the USSR invaded Afghanistan. 1979. And when was it that the war in Afghanistan ended? And when was it that the Soviet Union, I'm going to do it this way, Because this isn't, this isn't December 25th, but these are December 25th. When was it that Gorbachev collapses the Soviet Union and goes to work for the United Nations? 1991, on December 25th. And in the, the line of our history that Stephen and Odilio deal with, and, and Theodore, when does the 777 year, days that are typified by Lamech end? Twenty twenty one. This is December twenty fifth, when the Soviet Union invades Afghanistan in nineteen seventy nine. This is December 25th, 1991, when Gorbachev collapses the Soviet Union and takes a job at the United Nations. And this is December 25th, 2021. So all of these, I'm saying, are dealing with the Soviet Union, Russia, the King of the South, with the dragon power. December 25th is about the dragon power. So on December 25th, on several witnesses, 2021, what's going to happen? Well, here's where the Soviet Union ends. So I'm saying here, the, and we understood the Soviet Union way back when to be the king of the south. We were mistaken about Russia still being the king of the south. But here, the Soviet Union ends, and it's saying that here, Russia ends. The King of the South now transcends to a new manifestation of a dragon power. It ends. And what's the dragon power become? The UN. The UN begins.
And down here we have this illustrated by Gorbachev. When the Soviet Union ends, he goes to work for the United Nations. Um, so what, other, what else should we expect to see here on December 25th? Sunday worship. And I did find in the Encyclopedia Britannica it says that Clovis was baptized in 496. Well, let's go with the Encyclopedia Britannica because they're right yeah. and Wikipedia is wrong. The Chinese are in changing Wikipedia for their own political gain. And, and the Americans. And the Americans. People go in there and change it. Okay, so here. Um, in 496, what's going to happen? Here. Because I'm saying all these December 25ths are going to come to right here. Well, We've just talked about it. It's Clovis. Nuclear. What happens? Nu oh. the, the United States is baptized as Catholic. It's fully Catholic. Is that, is that okay? Yeah. Um, And here in 800, the United States becomes the premier, becomes Ahab. You know what that means. Ahab was the king of ten kingdoms. So, this is the, this is the end of the story of the king of the south that began back here over there in 1798, way back here, now the dragon is no longer symboled by the king of the south. He's symbolized by the United Nations. Okay, so we have one other thing to bring to this, and it's this here. From 1979, December 25th, 1225 to 11, why did I do that for an 11? I turned it into an H. November 9th, 1989, when the wall comes down, you have a 10-year proxy war in Afghanistan. G H. Yes? And we're seeing here down in this history that in 2011 there, this is a proxy war. I'm going to put proxy here. In 2011 a proxy war began in Syria, and we're suggesting that in 2021 it's going to come to a conclusion. Um, because it, at one level, this is the end of the Soviet Union in 1989. They still had, it begins to collapse. So we're taking, I'm taking this 10 years and bringing it down to here and saying that this proxy war is illustrating it. And in your notes, same page, you'll see a proxy war that was going on in the history of the Millerites. It's not quite the same, but it's too similar not to um, notice. It's got 1831 for its beginning and then it slows down or ceases till 1833 and then it begins again in 1839 and ends in 1841 so two years two years with kind of six years in between but history will tell you that this is the first Ottoman Egyptian War. And who is Egypt? Egypt's the world, but King of the South. Who's Turkey? King of the North. Okay, so this war here is between the King of the North and the King of the South. And this is the second Ottoman 
Egyptian war. So it's also a war between the king of the north and the king of the south. Who wins this first two-year war? The king of the south. Who won in 1798? King of the south. Who wins this war? King of the north. And who won the war in 1989? The king of the north. So you have this, this internal prophetic argument. But you have more than that. Because this is, this here, this history of the Ottomans and Egypt, what history is it? It's the history of Josiah Litch. It's the history of his prediction about the end of Ottoman supremacy. And in that story, if you go in that history, who is the Ottoman Empire struggling against? It's struggling against Egypt. Okay, it's this war, this 10 year period of time that was a proxy war. If you go into this history, it wasn't simply Turkey against Egypt. It was Turkey and its allies against Egypt and its allies. And where was it? Where did this war take place? What country was this proxy war being carried out in? Syria. See any parallel? The same is here. But with this history, we have this. This last two year war. We have August 11th, August is 8, right? 11, 1840, when an angel comes down. This history here, the end of Ottoman supremacy, plugs into here. And I'm saying that 1841, the end of this proxy war, is 2021. And I'm saying that 2021 is what? It's verse 41. In agreement with 1841. And that before verse 41, you're going to see the Islam used as a Bible Islam used as a Bible subject to produce an ingathering to God's movement. Is that the way to say it? This prediction here of August 11th, 1840 um, brought in how many people to the Millerite movement? 200,000 people. Okay. So before you get here, um, you're, going to see, you're going to see a... a an influx of Levites, which I'm saying are the 200,000. And what's it going to be based upon? It's going to be based upon the message of Islam that we give that parallels the message of Islam that was given here. So if I, could, if I would go one step further, I would go over here. What I'm doing now is I'm periscoping. Is that the way you do it? I'm, I'm taking these three witnesses I'm taking this history here now, and I'm blowing it up here. But now I'm going to take this history here, and I'm going to blow it up a little bit further. So it should be underneath it. And I'm going to say 1838 and 1840 are this dynamic. And what was that dynamic? There was a prediction about Islam. Over here, it's a prediction about Islam. It came two years before, um, a prediction and I'm saying therefore that this prediction would be July 18th, 2020. And when was this prediction first put in the public record? 2018, two years before. Okay, we didn't have the clarity of it then, but we could see why. Why could we see this? Ju July 18th, 2020. Comes after what?
isn't that th I'm, I'm confusing it here with this. Let me put it here. It comes after November 9th, 2019. Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. It comes after it, but how many days after? Two hundred and fifty-two days. So when we see before we got to November 9th, when we recognized November 9th, then we saw that after November 9th, 252 days after brought us to July 18th, 2020. That's certainly not the only witness to July 18th, 2020. But when this was put in place, Theodore saw it the next Sabbath. I put it in the public arena. And that was in 2018 when that prediction was made. Thus, two years before this prediction of Islam. And this history here, we're saying, is this history here? If this is where the 200,000 Levites come in, then this is verse 41 which was 1841, verse 41, the Sunday Law. And this history, we're d taking from this history, which is one of three proxy wars that are tied into the story of the dragon, and the dragon's date is December 25th, and it points to a Sunday Law. So this is the story of the king of the south, which is a story of a struggle for world dominion between Trump, Putin, and the papacy, but you don't see the papacy because the papacy's hidden in Samaria. It's forgotten during this history. But when you get to the conclusion of this struggle, Putin's gone, and Trump becomes Charlemagne. He becomes the king of the ten kings. Okay, this is the logic there. Um, and we have more to say about, of course, Fatima and the Beast and the Constitution. And I'll just put in place... So, what I want to say is, from the scriptures, Rafi and Paneum are in this history. It's Rafi and Paneum that are speaking to this line. Okay, I'm, I'm arguing that Rafi and Paneum is not part of the line of Fatima or the papacy in Daniel 11, nor is it part of the story of the Constitution. But I'm saying that there are parallel forces, okay? Because in each one of these three histories, which is speaking to this history of the 144,000, whether it's the Constitution, Fatima, or the King of the South, there's a struggle that goes on between liberalism and conservatism. And in this story, the struggle between um, Trump and Putin, between a republic or communism, liberalism and um, conservatism, this struggle here, this is where, in Daniel 11, you see Raphia and Paneum. That's my argument, that um, Raphia would be, where we, do we have it up here? Raphia would be July 18, 2020. And this is Raphia. And this is Paneum. What does that mean? A year and a half later. A year and a half later? Things that have been said are wrong. No, 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 no. no don't, don't jump to conclusions. If this is Paneum, that's what I'm saying, is this is Paneum, what is this? It's Paneum.
It's also Raphia. At the line of the king of the south, this is Raphia and Paneum. This is where the king of the south is fully defeated. That's Paneum. But this way mark here is the beginning of the image of the beast test for the world. And this is the beginning of the image of the beast test for the United States. Therefore, what is this also? It's also Paneum. And Rafi has got to come before it. Okay, so, but I'm saying that primarily Rafi and Paneum is in this line, but that, that dynamic of the struggle between conservatism and liberalism is in this line and this line and in this history. Okay, so I want to close out with just some thoughts here on page one of your notes. When did the impeachment of Donald Trump begin? The day he was elected. Okay, you could say before, but I, you can't say before. He because he wasn't president, okay? He has to be president before you can actually worry about impeaching him. So when did his impeachment begin? And you have a, a, an article from the a Washington Post. It says, and you can read it. it, it identifies that his impeachment began on January 20th, um, 2017. Uh, but when did, they f when did Pelosi and her cronies actually put in place the Articles of Impeachment. You have it right there. It'd be December, December 10th. Tenth, 2019. And I'm saying that was a victory for the Democrats. That's what they wanted to do ever since he was put in office. And they finally got it. But there's going to be a response. And what was that? I'm saying it was February 5th. Twenty twenty. What happened then? It's in your notes. He was acquitted. So you're saying that's the rock for the false prophet? In this struggle, I'm saying this is Raphia and this is Paneum. And of course, you gotta go back to when we first saw Paneum to get the the uh, implications of this. If when we first saw Paneum, what did we see? It, it, we won't go through it all, but what did we see? We saw the word Pan. Okay, the goddess Pan, or the god Pan. The god Pan is the goat god, and the goat is a sacrificial animal. It's a counterfeit worship system. And where's the premier worship site for the god Pan? It's in Paneum, Paneum, okay? In fact, what is that temple site? What does history and the Bible call it? What did Jesus call it? It's called the gates of hell. There was a temple with a cave that had a, a, a water, a, a well in it that they, it was almost bottomless. They assumed it was a bottomless pit, bottomless well. What did that water feed? It feeds the Jordan River. When was Jesus there? He was there when he was in Caesarea Philippi. And that's where he says to Peter, um, the gates of hell shall not prevail against this church that I'm going to found upon the rock. Okay, so he's showing this controversy between this temple, which was called the gates of hell, in Paneum, and it opened up all these, these ideas of Pan. Where, what's another idea of Pan that, that impacts this history? The 144,000, but this history here. Prophet. 
how does Panium impact this history? Pan well, ah, well, since February 5th, what are we dealing with? Uh, 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 maybe it's a pandemic, maybe it's not, but what's happening on Wall Street? They're in a panic, okay, so you're seeing these things now coming to light right where they're supposed to, but that's not what I'm getting at here. I'm getting about in the story, the internal story of us, where do we see Pan? It's a very, f it's, it is the foundation of both Millerites and our history. Go to Daniel 8, and we'll, we'll close with this thought probably. Daniel 8, there's much to say about these things, but in Daniel 8, in verse, to, verse, you really should walk through all of it, but we won't. Um, Let's just do verse 11. I, I'm, I'm trusting everyone here understands the oscillation. Okay, verse 9, 10, 11, and 12 are talking about the little horn. But verses 9 and 11, it's talking about the little horn and the masculine. So it's talking about pagan Rome. And verses 10 and 12, it's talking about the little horn and the feminine. So it's talking about papal Rome. But in verse 11, it says, speaking of pagan Rome, Yea, he... Pagan Rome magnified himself even to the prince of the host. Who's the prince of the host? Christ. Did pagan Rome magnify itself to the prince of the host? Well, at the cross, most definitely. And by pagan Rome, the daily. Paganism. By pagan Rome, the religion of paganism was, and this is not sir as it is in Daniel 11.31 and Daniel 12.11. This is room, and it means to lift up and exalt. Okay, so by pagan Rome, the religion of paganism was lifted up and exalted, and the place of pagan Rome's sanctuary was cast down. Where was the place of pagan Rome's sanctuary? The city of Rome, it was cast down by Constantine in the year 330. But what was pagan Rome's sanctuary? The pantheon. The pantheon. The pan pantheon. Pantheon temple. Pantheon temple. The temple of the gods. Okay, so how does this impact us here at the end? Because in the struggle between the true prophet and the false prophet, in the internal movement at the end of the world, what is our primary point of reference from the spirit of prophecy? The Alpha apostasy typifies the Omega apostasy. And if you're going to summarize Kellogg's rebellion in the Alpha apostasy into one word, what would it be? Pantheism. Pantheism. It's the religion that is connected with the Pantheon Temple in Rome. It's the religion of the dragon. It's, it's the religion of the dragon that plays out in the Omega movement. Have we seen the religion of the dragon come into the Omega movement? Because if you do, you're seeing pantheism and its point of reference is the Pantheon Temple in Rome Pan, pan, pan. Okay, so what I'm saying here is that we have a raffia in this history and a paneum in this history internally. And what's the raffia in this line? I'm going to put November 9th, but yeah, September 7th goes along with that. It's kind of a progressive history. November 9th. What is this? This is the, the offering of the priest of the grove and the prophets of Baal that, that was worthless. Nothing happened with it. 
Did their offering, did anything happen with their offering? Not a thing. What's Elijah's offering? July 18th, 2020. And what will that be? It'll be Paneum. It'll be Paneum. So this over here being July 18th, 2020, would be Paneum at the internal for the priests. Yes? Over here, it's Paneum in the line of the King of the South. This is Raphia in the King of the South. This is Paneum in the line of the true or false prophets in the story of Carmel. Are you... Following the logic, shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the light that you're shedding upon your people at this time. And we see that we're approaching these tremendous events with blinding speed and we have much to do. We ask that you'd help us to get the, the things in place that we need to have in place to fulfill our responsibility. We want to get that warning into the public record. Uh, we want to do our part to share this information with the brothers and sisters that are willing to hear around planet earth we ask a blessing upon all these endeavors and we thank you for these things in jesus name amen